Hello, everyone. My name is Christopher Shell, and I like to speak to you briefly about the research that I do and that we do in my lab that takes a look at how society feeds into ecology, feeds into evolution, and then back into society. And how all of this is important for the ways in which we understand our systems. As an ecologist, for me, the way in which I understand how my animals and the study systems that I'm interested in, like this coyote that you see here, are navigating our systems, but then also what does that mean for the way in which we are connected to nature, the way in which we are established in nature and how we perceive nature. And I oftentimes share many stories, this one being one of them about how coyotes are able to get into these built environments and not only survive and cope with the many disturbances that are found within cities, but thrive and find these strategies that allow them to truly persist in these environments that we thought were inhospitable. What's important about this story here, this is the Quiznos coyote that was captured on camera in 2008 in a downtown Quiznos in Chicago. And this story has fascinated me as well as many other stories of these animals and how they're developing strategies to survive again and thrive in these urban systems. And what's really kind of interesting, here's another one of raccoons in Redwood City finding their way into a locked chase bank at night is that we are at the nexus of this system. We sit at the center of the way in which these animals are responding to and adapting to cities and really to us. And when you then start to peel the layers of what that means and how wildlife are interacting with us, what the biological consequences of those interactions are, it's hard to not see how things like social inequality represent these fundamental ecological issues in a sense of social inequality and inequalities therein, systemic oppression, racism, and the like generate injustices both on the natural and the social landscapes that influence not just the way in which people are thriving and surviving, but also our non-human neighbors that are in these environments as well. And it should be noted that urban wildlife, which is my expertise, they're everywhere. Um, from Singapore and these urban smooth colliders to yes, raccoons and point defiance and in, in all throughout the Pacific Northwest. So figuring out ways to promote coexistence is, is perhaps one of the most important aspects of my research and will be one of the most urgent pressing issues into the future as we think about how we share our natural world in ways that decolonizes the way in which we perceive the natural landscape. And that means that we need to take a, a real deep look at ourselves and how we partition and fragment that, that natural landscape. So these two photos are just a side-by-side -side comparison of two neighborhoods that are here, right here in Tacoma in the Pacific Northwest. So the photo on the left being one of University Place, the photo on the right being of Southeast Tacoma. And I oftentimes will share these two photos in complete contrast of each other to show that there are these stark differences in the amount of vegetation that's in either of these neighborhoods. And not coincidentally, the wealth of those neighborhoods is also stratified too. So that wealth, that luxury creates this effect that influences our natural systems, that influences what organisms are where. So for, for me and for our lab, we use these remote triggered camera traps with the Grit City Carnivore Project, which is this collaboration between UW Tacoma, Point Defiance Zoom and Aquarium, and Metro Parks Tacoma to try and understand how animals are navigating across the landscape. And we get tons of amazing traditional wildlife ecology photos, but these photos mean so much more than just the animals that are in them. They tell us where the animals are going, how they're moving, are they able to survive in certain microhabitats relative to others? And what does that mean for the way in which we create our cities and how equitable our cities are? So the more research we do, the more we start to uncover how inequity within our cities essentially constrains the ability to have biodiversity in our cities. And that's all important because biodiversity is huge for ecosystem function and ecosystem health, which comes right back to us. So if we want to have healthy, equitable ecosystems, we need to think about the ways in which we dismantle structures of systemic racism and oppression and classism. And to that point, my colleagues and I have put together several syntheses that show how 
structural racism and classism affects all of the landscape heterogeneities that are relevant to the wildlife that live in our cities. So if we care about wildlife, and certainly we should already care about people, but this is another argument to show that the way in which we care about each other is essentially an outward sign of the way in which we care about our natural world. So when you look through the eyes of the coyote, when you look through the eyes of the urban coyote moving through the streets of many of our major metropolitan areas, those eyes see the inequality that's baked into the concrete, that's baked into the asphalt. And as a biologist, I'm curious certainly about how this animal is surviving given those inequalities. But it goes without mention that those inequalities have profound impacts on human societies as well. And if we want to be able to save wildlife and save our natural world, we need to start by saving ourselves from the ills of white supremacy and anti-Black racism and many, many other social caste systems that pervade our natural world in a way that cannot be measured just by traditional science alone. So the combination of natural and social sciences need to come together and we can learn those lessons from the animals that show us the way in which they navigate our cities. Thank you.